Good morning and welcome to the April 18th, 2023 public hearing and public meeting of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. We'll begin this morning by taking attendance and I'll ask our general counsel, Mark Silverman, to call the roll. Chair Carroll. Here. Vice Chair Bland. Here. Commissioner Chapin. Here. Commissioner Chen. Here. Commissioner Chu. Commissioner Ginsburg. Here. Commissioner Goldblum. Here. Commissioner Jefferson. Here. Commissioner Lutfi. Commissioner Master. Here. Commissioner Holford Smith. Here. All right, good morning again, and welcome to the public hearing and public meeting of the Landmarks Preservation Commission for today, April 18th. Um, this meeting is being held via Zoom and live streamed on our YouTube channel. So if you would like to testify in any of the public hearing items, you may do so by joining the Zoom meeting at the estimated time that is shown for that item um, that can be found on our agenda, public hearing agenda, which can be found on our website. Um, and you can also watch the proceedings if you go to our YouTube channel and um, follow along. And uh, this morning, we're going to start with one quick public meeting item, and then we are going to move to a public hearing to review applications for work on designated properties. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our General Counsel, Mark Silverman, and our Director of Preservation, Corey Harala, to take us through the first public meeting item. Thanks, Sarah. And I will note that, um, for the record, that public meeting item number two, 827, 831 Broadway, uh, has been laid over and will be presented at a future public hearing date, uh, but not today. Uh, so with that, we'll go into uh, public meeting item number one. This is a citywide proposal to initiate rulemaking under the City Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, proposed amendments to chapters 2, 5, 7, and 12 of Title 63 of the Rules of the City of New York, consisting of amendments to existing rules including amendments concerning storefronts, signage, sidewalks, HVAC and solar panels, expedited certificates of no effect, master plans and district master plans, the historic preservation grant program, and a new proposed chapter 14 concerning public petition for rulemaking. I'll turn it over to our general counsel, Mark Silberman, to begin. Thank you, Corey. Uh, commissioners, today you will be asked to vote to calendar a package of rules uh, as described by Corey um, and to adopt a new rule. The, the amendments, as you said, cover signage, storefronts, sidewalks, HVACs and solar panels, uh, changes to master plans, expedited certificates, no effect and the historic preservation grant program. And there's also a new rule uh, covering uh, a process required by the City Administrative Procedures Act uh, for the public to petition the agency to consider a rule. Uh, before Corey and Leanne walk you through a summary of the proposed rules, let me say a few words about rules in general. And at the end of this uh, presentation, I will walk you through the process. Um, can the next slide, please? Um, as many of you already know, we have an extensive body of rules that allow the staff to approve work. These rules are codified in Title 63 of the rules of the City of New York, um, and uh, they're quite effective. Uh, approximately 95% of all applications are handled by the staff pursuant to these rules. Um, rules play an important role in the agency's mission to protect uh, the city's historic buildings and sites by ensuring our regulation is, is as efficient as possible and in our equity framework as well by promoting transparency into the regulatory process. Rules support the broader purposes of the city as well as the landmarks law to support economic growth and recovery uh, by streamlining regulatory review. Um, by making it clear what criteria are being applied and therefore what materials are needed, rules pr promote transparency and predictability in the regulatory process. Finally, rules um, concerning HVAC and solar installations, as well as the uh, amendments to the sidewalks, further the agency's sustainability and climate resiliency goals. Um, and uh, with respect to HVAC and solar, uh, the proposed modifications to, uh, will allow the, the proposed amendments will allow the staff to approve modifications to installations and new installations 
where there is some increased visibility due to new codes and rules um, and by delegating to the staff the authority to approve certain types of solar panel installations. Um, they, again, proposed uh, changes to sidewalks will allow various types of plantings, uh, which will also support the resiliency process. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, as you'll, when Corey and Land walk you through uh, the rules uh, and, and you think about where the criteria come from, the criteria are embedded, embedded in the existing and the proposed rules that really derive from three situations. First, they can codify existing staff practices. Um, and um, so we uh, codify those and put those in a rule. This, secondly, um, where the proposed change is a modification to an existing rule to take into account changing codes and rules from outside the agency. Um, third, where the commissioners, where you, have consistently applied a set of standards and criteria to approve a specific work type, it's appropriate uh, or to delegate that to the staff for, to make it a more efficient uh, regulatory review. Uh, this is the case with the proposed codification of the painted wall sign rule and some of the solar panel installations being proposed. Um, with that as a background, I will turn back. I will turn it back to Corey and Leanne to walk you through um, most of the proposed changes. Thanks, Mark. Um, so we've divided the amendment categories into three basic areas we're going to walk through. Um, first, I will take you through our commercial updates for signage, um, some painted wall signs, and some other changes at commercial establishments. Corey will then walk you through the sustainability and climate resiliency updates, and then Mark will walk through some miscellaneous updates. Uh, next slide, please. So first grouping is commercial updates, and this includes several um, amendments and changes to the rules designed to foster and support our local businesses. Next slide. First, we're looking to expand our current practices and to add flexibility for businesses to use banner signs featuring a flexible fabric that's attached to a projecting armature in lieu of requiring just a rigid bracket sign as our current rules provide for. These signs would still need to follow the current size, mounting height, mounting location, quantity and color parameters in the rules for rigid bracket signs. And we would continue to assess whether signage was impacting significant historic materials or features. We're also looking at making adjustments related to limited circumstances when uniformity for these types of signs and their armatures is appropriate. Next slide. Next is related to signage applied to glazing. We're clarifying the current staff practice for calculating sign size for vinyl decals and painted signage, and also expanding allowable sign types to include dimensional letters applied to glass at storefront transoms. Dimensional letters generally look similar to applied decals when viewed from the sidewalk and still satisfy the intent of the current rules in terms of having minimal impact on the building. And we feel this will offer equal signage opportunities to storefronts that may not have a typical sign band area. Next slide. Plaque signage was a new sign type introduced by the last set of rule revisions in 2018. After a few years of implementing these rules, we've identified some gaps and adjustments that are needed, including expanding where these installations can occur, allowing for additional sign materials, modifying the calculation for sign sizes, increasing the permitted sizes slightly and dividing into two overall size categories that are based on the building type and size of the building. Next slide. We're also incorporating some technological updates to the sign rules, which include clarifying that LED neon is permitted to use for interior signage in lieu of a traditional neon sign. Uh, this type of sign mimics a traditional neon sign, but may be less expensive for a business to purchase, cost less to operate, and last longer than a traditional neon sign. So again, trying to expand opportunities for businesses um, and help them to be able to make themselves known. LPC's rules don't currently specifically address interior TV and LED screens. So we're proposing to formally add these as a permitted sign type and to set criteria related to maximum area of screens, positioning within display windows and setbacks from glazing, similar to our current regulation for interior partitions and vitrines. 
Next slide. We're also proposing to add a new section to the sign rules to clarify what signage types are exempt from permitting. Some of these, like allowing replacement of new flags at poles that were installed prior to a building's designation, are codifying current agency practices. Others, like swapping vinyl decal or banner signs, are newly added given the minimal impacts of this type of signage and how frequently signage and tenants change over. We're hoping this adds predictability for business owners, tenants, and brokers and helps new businesses get quicker exposure to street traffic. Next slide. There are a few other miscellaneous changes that we're proposing that would also impact commercial establishments, including, including allowing installation of grayscale vinyl at display windows that meet certain criteria and where space is used for back of house programming like food prep or employee areas, and also readjusting our assessment of the cumulative impact of signage to include all of the various sign types being added and addressed by these rule provisions. Next slide. Finally, the revisions will codify current and reoccurring commission level approvals for painted wall sign master plans. This change would allow staff to issue these, per issue these permits if a proposal meets a certain set of criteria, including size, location, use of a border, et cetera. And there's also a precedent for painted wall signs at the subject building or within the historic district. So that wraps up the amendments related to commercial updates. I will now turn it over to Corey Harala, who will walk you through the next section of updates. Okay, thank you, Leanne. Uh, the next group of updates in the proposed rules amendments uh, pertains to work under the umbrella of sustainability and climate resiliency. We believe these modest changes will continue to demonstrate the compatibility of historic preservation and sustainability goals by enabling adaptations to historic buildings and sites that reduce carbon emissions and improve energy efficiency and resiliency without compromising their historic integrity. Next slide. Uh, the first update in this group pertains to tree pits. Staff can currently approve installing new tree pits in concrete sidewalks or enlarging existing ones and modestly enlarging tree pits in bluestone sidewalks. This amendment will expand staff review of tree pits, planting beds and bioswales in terms of enlargements and or new installations. Large tree pits, planting beds, and bioswales support healthy trees by removing obstructions to roots and have other environmental benefits, such as absorbing and filtering stormwater runoff, providing clean air and shading, and reducing the urban heat island effect. General criteria will address size, location, abutment, and impact on historic paving. Next slide. The second update in this group pertains to solar panels and to a lesser extent, other HVAC and mechanical equipment. Our current rules do address solar panels broadly in the HVAC chapter, defined as a type of mechanical equipment. Flat and, solar, uh, flat and sloped solar panel arrays and elevated solar canopies on flat roofs, either non-visible or minimally visible from a public thoroughfare, are regularly reviewed by the staff using these existing rules. But typically, solar panels on sloped roofs are not, due to their unavoidable visibility caused by siting requirements. Solar panels and energy storage systems are expanding throughout the city, uh, including in our historic districts. Over the past few years, through the LPC public hearing process, proposals for solar installations on freestanding houses and other building types have been found appropriate and approved by the commissioners. All of these were visible installations, and with staff input on siting, configuration, and appearance of the panels and related equipment, a consistent successful approach was developed. We are proposing to codify what has become routine commission approvals on buildings with sloped roofs. Next slide. Here are a few examples of commission approvals for solar panels on various buildings with sloped roofs. Uh, freestanding houses are the most common building type with sloped roofs that we regulate, but we are also proposing to include row houses, semi-attached houses, and other building types. Notably, we are excluding designed mansard roofs, towers and turrets, and other crowning elements. Installations on those types of roofs would still require commission level review. We are also anticipating more retrofits of previously approved structures like bulkheads, rooftop additions, and pergolas to take solar panels. So that is being considered in the amendments as well. Next slide. 
Last, we are proposing a limited and targeted expansion of visible installations we already review at staff level, such as sloped solar panel arrays and solar canopies on flat roofs, as well as more typical HVAC equipment. In some cases, solar panels and other HVAC installations are visible through a gap in the street wall, but not visible from anywhere else. We find that these fleeting views seen in the context of plain secondary facades and often over other utilitarian accretions do not detract from the buildings or the streetscape. And the trade-off is not seeing the installations over the front facades of the buildings. Additionally, as an overarching matter, this update accounts for and recognizes that changing standards, including building safety, energy efficiency, and resiliency rules and codes may require adjustments to existing HVAC and mechanical equipment and will create more stringent siting standards for new equipment, uh, which sometimes results in more visibility of these installations. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Mark Sil uh, Silberman to go over some other miscellaneous updates. Thank you, Corey. Uh, finally, there's a, a handful of sort of miscellaneous things uh, before we get to the new rule. Um, the first has to do with master plans, uh, specifically um, uh, removing the current uh, process for issuance of what's called an authorization to proceed. That was a, a approval type that is uh, issued in the context of building specific and district-wide master plans. and was seen as a way in, uh, when originally drafted to um, expedite review and uh, not have to issue other permit types. But as time, uh, over time, DOB is more and more requiring uh, issuance of certificates of, of uh, no effect and other things so that the staff is often issuing two permit types. So we are removing the, the reference to the authorization to proceed and replacing it with other um, permit types, including uh, reports, which the existing district master plans uh, did not include. Um, secondly, uh, with respect to the expedited certificate of no effect rule, we are eliminating the need, we're proposing to eliminate the need for an owner to submit a sworn statement saying that the application complies with the rules. Um, the architect or engineer must still uh, file signed and sealed drawings indicating compliance. Uh, and this just eliminates one thing that has oftentimes resulted in per, uh, delays in issuance of uh, ex Um uh, Thirdly, the Historic Preservation Grant Program uh, we're amending uh, the eligibility requirements for grant applicants to reflect the federal standards and current practices of, of the grant program. This would clarify that qualifying buildings do not have to be in a census tract that qualifies, but can qualify in, in what's known as a spot basis um, in compliance with federal rules. Um, and finally, um, in compliance with CAP, as I mentioned before, uh, we are proposing a process for members of the public to petition the agency uh, for rules um, to, or to adopt or, or consider a rule. Um, the chair would be uh, uh, authorized to review the petition. Uh, it, it could deny the petition. It could, if it chooses to accept um, the proposal, what that means is that the agency would uh, in the near future uh, bring forward to a calendaring vote um, a rule that is based on what was be, what the petitioner submitted. It doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to be the exact language or thing that was proposed, but it's something in the same uh, in the same vein. Um, and and it would be brought forward for the commissioners to consider calendaring and to consider uh, later. Um, and um, next slide, please. Uh, finally, um, just a last few minutes of thoughts about process. Um, so today, commissioners, you'll be asked to, to vote to calendar this package of rules and the new rule for a future public hearing. Uh, we are proposing to hold that hearing on May 23rd. Um, the hearing and a full copy of the rules will be available in the city record as of Thursday, and we posted it on our website and the city's NYC rules website. We encourage uh, all members of, uh, of the public who are interested in these uh, rules to review them uh, and submit testimony. Um, you can do that beforehand or you can submit them at the public hearing. All testimony will be avail made available to commissioners. After the hearing is closed, staff will review 
uh, the proposed uh, the testimony and consider proposed changes um, uh, derived both from the public comment as well as any comments from the commissioners. Um, and we may uh, modify the proposed rules uh, and bring them back uh, ultimately for a vote. Um, if they were approved, they would be effective 30 days after publication in the city record. Um, and with that, uh, I and Corey and Leanne are available for any questions, Commissioner. Thank you all for that great presentation. We do have some questions. Commissioner Goldblum, please go ahead. Okay. Um, tell me if this is not the appropriate time to ask these questions, but the summary sounds very, very uh, interesting and good. Very, very nice. Nice. Uh, love the rules. Um, on signs, um, the indoor screen uh, comment, um, what we, we, we have, as far as I, I, I understand, an 18 inch rule that if something is within 18 inches or more than 18 inches in from a glass wall, it's kind of, it's on the, it's on the uh, tenant. It's not really governed by LPC. Um, is that 18 inch rule something that was, I mean, was the 18 inch rule kind of written down somewhere or is it, is it, is it a kind of shorthand to determine visibility from the outside? I'll uh, take that one. The 18 inch rule is actually written down relative to, uh, it's actually in two areas. The first of which is for interior illuminated signage. Um, so if, a, if an illuminated sign is set back more than 18 inches from the glass, the commission doesn't regulate that. Um, and then we also account for that in interior partitions and vitrines um, within our storefront section of the rules. And that both mentions these partitions need to be at least 18 inches from the glass, but do also set parameters for how much of the glass they can um, block and be constructed okay. in front of. So it's you know an overall coverage of the display area of the glass, um, in addition to a length and a width of the overall display window. And so what we're proposing to do since these LED and TV screens um, tend to mimic more of an interior partition than necessarily and an, like a smaller interior illuminated sign. We're proposing to just tie the LED screens to our current rules about interior partitions. Um, Is there a limit on the size of those partitions? Yes, the current rules do uh, limit the size of those partitions already. And also that 18 inch setback from the glass. Very interesting. So in other words, if, I, if I'm a, a, a retail person and I want to put uh, LED screens, they're not covered by the signage uh, issue, by the signage totals, they're covered by partition totals? Well, currently they're not in the rules at all. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so so this we're trying to add a little bit of predictability so that businesses see that they're an available sign type um, and it does, it will show up in the signage portion of the rules, um, but will be regulated in so far as we regulate interior partitions. Okay, great. So the same criteria would apply. Next, uh, on the painted signs, we had talked about having a kind of staff update and review of the, how it's gone since, since we last changed them a few years ago. I still think that's a great idea, and it, it might be a good idea to do that in the context of this uh, rule session, because if there are changes that the mission wants to make to the rules based on the experience, then now seems like a good time. Um, in terms of solar, um, do we talk in the new rules about replacing slate or clay tile roofs in order to put in uh, solar panels? Are we dealing with solar shingles? And how are we dealing with batteries, which off, which I think per fire code are gonna wind up being on the outside of a lot of buildings? I'll take that one. Um, with regard to historic roofing materials, that is uh, certainly being considered. And as currently proposed um, for installations that may be proposed for front facing slopes, so slopes that sort of face a street facade, uh, those would not be uh, something that are eligible for stop level review if they had to be um, uh, partially removed or otherwise altered to take the solar panels. However, at uh, secondary roof slopes, side facades, rear facades, uh, the rules would, the proposed rule would allow for 
uh, sort of minor removals with the caveat that they should be stored, salvaged and stored on site for future repairs. Uh, so that could be a, that could be a problem because I think most of these most solar people that I've talked to want a perfect warranted roof under their panels. Um, and generally, they don't like slate or clay tile because then you can't go up and maintain it without breaking them. So that may be a backdoor way of stopping, you know, of getting in the way of solar solar installation. So I, I just think it should be considered and known, you know, addressed. Okay, and we we have seen very few applications as it is for installations on uh, historic. Yeah. Um, the uh, second question was regarding solar shingles. Yeah. Uh, we actually already have a provision in the current rules uh, from the last uh, amendments five years ago. Oh, right that does allow for solar shingles if there is no historic roofing material currently on the roof, and if those shingles do a better job of replicating or at least recalling historic roofing than the uh, current uh, roofing material. And then finally, with regard to batteries, uh, such as a power wall storage, uh, if, you're, if you're thinking about res uh, residential installations, um, that would fall under, we, uh, we have that also defined under mechanical equipment, Okay. Um, it would also be something that could be approved under sort of like utilitarian equipment. And generally speaking, these are installed near electrical panels and on side yeah. facades, and we would be able to accommodate those as well. Great. Last, last two. Um, one of the problems that we talked about at some point in the past was the tie-in to the DOB for public for post-approval amendments and how stuff seems to sneak through at that point. Uh, without getting pushed automatically to LPC. Can rules be used, city rules be used to try to address that problem? And um, is there a way to break, when you know when you get the comments on these rules, when you get the comments on these rules, I think it'd be useful to both uh, have a little bit of analysis of what, what the past has been in terms of the types of uh, staff level approvals that have been made, how many for townhouse rear yards, how many for rooftops, you know, the kind of the big categories, having some sense of like the percentages would, would be helpful for me anyway, just to understand how the rules are working. We, we can certainly uh, sort of, uh, we can talk to you uh, further and get, get a sense of exactly what you're looking for. We can try to, to do some data analysis, Commissioner. Thanks. And um, how about the DOB PAA rule? Is there, what, can we do anything with our rules to help that happen? Well, you know, right now the law says that DOB can't do it, right? The DOB can't <laughs> issue a permit uh, or, or approve work without getting our approval. So our, our passing a rule- Wouldn't do uh, anything. Doesn't do anything for DOB. Uh, and okay. after Applicants are, our permits say that if anything changes, they have to come back and give us a heads up already, so. Great, all right, thanks. They do, and and I I think that it is pretty rare, actually, that a, a permit for major work gets a, a approved under a post-approval amendment at DOB without coming back to us. So I think it, it's not a widespread problem, but it has happened on occasion. Thanks. Is it on the palm hole, is it okay. Commissioner Chapin? Yes. 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 Yeah. Commissioner Chapin, did you have a question? Oh, thank. Okay. Yes, I I uh, did. Uh, first, I'd like to say that you know, in general, I think this is this is a very good thing. Obviously, particularly uh, some of the things like the tree pits and the solar panels and the painted signs, uh, which are things that will help. Uh, help the city and also uh, expedite the process. Um, I guess my one just question without having a chance yet to review everything is that the owner signed document, I'm, I'm very much in favor of course of expediting the process for applicants in a, in a reasonable way. But we run into these things where owners sort of say they don't realize changes are being made, though many times that's the contractor goes off and does something and or the architect that, uh, and I'm not sure that the owner signed document would have much impact on that. So if you could just, uh, uh, you know, uh, elaborate a little on uh, the purpose, the original supposed purpose of that and 
uh, you know, why we're getting rid of it. Yeah. And, and I would say that is just for Mark answers. That is a very, it's a sort of a very minor administrative change. It does not change what the staff will be reviewing. So the staff will still review drawings um, for the work. And this is only for interior work only. It's a sworn statement oh, that okay. the applicant makes when it's for interior work only. Um, they otherwise sign the application form just like they do with every other application. And uh, and again, the staff does Fine. look at the drawings to see if there's any impact on the exterior. Mark, did you want to answer any further? Uh, no, uh, I was, I was just going to say yeah. that that was... Yes, just for the expedited certificates of no effect, which are for interior work only. Okay, right. great. There's, there's, Thank and you. and the, you know, the... That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, we are, uh, you know, I mean, this is after we did approve a very large set of amendments and new rules, as you know, in, in January of 2019, after multiple public hearings. And this is really after sort of using those rules for a while, we've noticed some gaps and things, additional things that would make the rules more efficient and um, clear. And we also are responding to newer technologies and making sure that our regulatory work is up to date with that. So these are, uh, this is a much smaller package than the package you all reviewed in 2019 and really sort of uh, building on that. Um, and we have done outreach with, with various stakeholders, including the preservation advocacy groups, um, many of the installers for both signage and the solar panels and other um, resiliency insta uh, installations and um, have gotten some feedback on what works and what doesn't work from a technical point of view. Um, and I think that we will hear more, I hope, from everybody at the public hearing, and that will give us an opportunity to think about any questions that we haven't uh, already, already currently considered. And of course, please let us know if you have any questions at all. We'll be sharing all of the testimony with you at, uh, uh, when after we have the public hearing or any testimony that comes before the public hearing, we'll obviously share with you in advance. Um, and so if we can, I'd like to make a motion to calendar these for a public hearing that would be held on May 23rd. Commissioner Goldblum, would you make that motion? So moved, sorry. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing, uh, the, the Rules amendments are calendared. We'll hold a public hearing on May 23rd. And as Mark said, the rules uh, will be posted on our website, the city's website, as well as in the city record. And we hope that um, many people will participate in this process and, um, and that we'll be able to come back with a package to present to you after the public hearing for a vote. All right, we'll now move to our public hearing agenda. Okay, and we'll start with public hearing item number one, LPC 23-06476. This is an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 2099, lot 74, 64 South Portland Avenue in the Fort Greene Historic District. This is an early Italianate style house built circa 1852, and the application is to replace windows. Sorry. Um. Good morning, Commissioners Marie Garino, Preservation Staff. The item before you is 64 South Portland Avenue in the Fort Greene Historic District. The building is located on the west side of the street between DeKalb and Lafayette Avenues, and the application is to replace the windows throughout the front facade. The windows are currently double hung wood windows with a two over two configuration at the basement, second and third floors, um, and a four over four configuration at the parlor floor. The applicant is proposing to match the existing windows in terms of configuration, finish, operation, and details, with the only difference being a change in material from all wood to aluminum clad wood. Here are the 1940 tax photos for the row. Number 64 is in the middle. 
And here's an existing condition photo of the row, again, number 64 is in the middle. And here is a photo of 64 South Portland Avenue and 308 Cumberland Street, which is a building of a similar age type and style as 64 South Portland Avenue, and which is also located within the Fort Greene Historic District. The installed windows at 308 Cumberland Street are aluminum clad wood windows approved by the commission in 2020. And here are some close up photos of the aluminum clad wood windows at 308 Cumberland Street. And here are the existing and proposed details for the new windows at South Portland, at 64 South Portland Avenue. And the applicant, Jim Hill, is here to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Marie. Commissioners, no, we do have some questions. So, Vice Chair Blanche, please go ahead. Um, is the only reason this is before us because it's uh, aluminum clad as opposed to wood, painted wood? That's correct. On uh, row houses, the staff can only approve aluminum windows uh, at, when they're when the building historically had one over one double hung windows, and in those cases, we have a wood brick mold. But for buildings, row houses that historically had multi light windows, the rule currently only authorizes staff to approve uh, wood. But as Marie pointed out, we have approved aluminum clad wood and other row houses uh, given obviously the distance. My, yeah. Thank you for, for clarifying that. I had forgotten that. But obviously, my question behind it is shouldn't Maybe this be considered a rule <laughs> that could be uh, adopted uh, uh, so that staff could approve these sorts of things. Anyway, I think thank you. It's a good it's a good question because the commission has started to approve it more frequently, and yeah. I think we found that the aluminum clad would I, I understand better details. Aluminum would be different, but aluminum clad wood to me is smart. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, I don't see any other questions. Let's see if we have public testimony. If you'd like to testify on this item, please raise your hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through the testimony. Thank you, Chair Carroll. Uh, we received a couple of signups beforehand, so we will be hearing from them first. Uh, the first signup was Lucy Levine from the Historic Districts Council. So Lucy Levine, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. So if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Lucy Levine. I'm speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. Our preference for this front facade is all wood double hung windows as existing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Christina Conroy from VSNY. So, Christina Conroy, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. I'm Christina Conroy for the Victorian Society in New York. Now, founded in New York City in 1966, the Victorian Society in America is dedicated to fostering the appreciation and preservation of our 19th and early 20th century heritage. The New York chapter promotes preservation of our historic districts, individuals, and scenic landmarks, interiors, and civic art. 64 Portland Avenue is one of a row of four houses, numbers 20, uh, 62 through 68. The historic photos for this row show that all four houses have one over one sash. Please note that the applicant has incorrectly labeled the tax photo for 64 South Portland, stating that the building had four over four sash at the parlor floor. This is clearly an error. The picture shows that the parlor floor had one over one sash. We believe that what appears to be a vertical mutton bar, which gives the appearance of two over two sash is actually a gap in the drapes inside the glass. We are attaching a blow up of the tax photo to show that this gap is not symmetrical with the sash as a vertical, an actual vertical mutton would be. 
three of the four houses in the row, including 64, currently have four over four wood windows at the parlor floor. We don't know if these windows were installed prior to designation or without permits or on what evidence this configuration is based, but unless there is evidence of the four over four sash predating the tax photos, we urge the proposal be modified to return to the documented one over one wood windows. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And I'm looking through our list of attendees now and I do not see any further hands raised. So I will just note for the record that Brooklyn Community Board two recommends approval and I will bring it back to you, Chair Carroll. Okay, thank you very much. So I'd like to turn back to the staff and to the applicant and ask if you'd like to address the question about the configuration of the windows. I'll, I'll uh, just jump in for the yeah. configuration. Um, so we, you know, when the staff reviews historic photographs, we always um, kind of recognize and understand that the tax photos from the 1940s are just a snapshot in time. In many cases, as is in the case here, was taken 80 to 90 years after the building was constructed. And so they are not always representative of the original window configuration. And we believe that is the case here. Uh, a mid 1800 buildings, uh, 1800s building would not have one over one windows as that size glass was not widely available in New York City until a couple of decades later, except for very rare uh, circumstances where something was imported from Europe. Uh, so while we may not know the exact original configuration, we are certain it was a multi-light configuration. And so the staff is reviewing that in the context of other approvals in this row and other buildings of this uh, style and age. Thank you. Um, does the applicant want to add anything at this point before we move to our discussion? Any final comments? Uh, hi, yeah, this is uh, Jim Hill from Urban Pioneer and Architecture. Uh, no, I don't really think I, I need to add. I think it's been pretty well covered. Uh, I see that the gap in the meeting uh, sash kind of led to a mislabeling of the lower floor windows, but uh, I think as Corey pointed out, it really is more about what is um, more likely original versus what was present when those tax votes were taken. So um, I don't think I really have anything more to add. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, commissioners, do we have any final questions? Okay, I'm gonna ask you all to unmute so that we can move to close our hearing and begin our discussion. Right. Um, so as was uh, Corey presented, uh, the, the uh, configuration of the window was determined based on staff's knowledge and applicants' knowledge and expertise on historic window technology. Um, the reason this application is not eligible for a staff level permit is because uh, in uh, row houses the staff with, that historically had multi-light windows, the staff can only approve a uh, wood window. Um, however, the staff can approve aluminum window sashes in row houses that had one over one double hung windows and in large, uh, larger apartment buildings and other building types. Um, but this is uh, before us because it's a row house that we believe historically had multi-light windows. The commission has approved uh, multi, uh, aluminum clad wood windows in similar row houses, finding that the profiles, because it's an aluminum clad window, the profiles closely match. And because row houses uh, are set back behind an areaway, they're changing material is not as discernible from the street. So that's been the basis for uh, other decisions in the past. So we'll begin this discussion. Commissioner Chapin, would you start this one? Uh, yeah, I can uh, approve this. I think it is similar to many others that we have approved. And I think that the appearance will be, and the fact that it's uh, a wood, uh, with the aluminum clad, I think is uh, something we've approved before and it will not be a call any attention to itself. So I can approve this as presented. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. I, I, I agree. Uh, I think it's appropriate. I also wanna uh, echo Fred. It's, it's funny this rule because it, it, it kind of tags the staff level uh, 
benchmark to the material of the window as opposed to the design of the window. I think there's a lot less difference between a, a, a an aluminum clad wood Marvin window and a replacement, you know, acorn uh, aluminum sash that we, that, you know, that is oddly enough approvable. I think that, that uh, if I were to suggest, I think that the, 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 the issue should be more about the design of the, of the profile. I think that I've used these clad windows myself. You really, I can't tell unless I go up and hit it with my ring or key. So I think it's totally appropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen. Uh, likewise, yes, but I think we may need to close the hearing first. I think we'll skip the closing oh, the hearing. Did I? Oh, thank you so much for catching that. I'm sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> Commissioner Chen, would you make a motion to close the hearing? I'll be delighted to, so moved. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you very much for catching that. One week off and everything's gone. Okay, uh, Vice Chair Bland. I just want to note that Wellington has a new job as parliamentarian. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, I can accept this as, a, a, as appropriate as... A, as applied for. Thank you. Commissioner Ginsburg. Uh, totally appropriate. And I would also agree that looking at changing the rules so this could be done at staff level makes a lot of sense. Okay. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. Uh, I also agree that it's appropriate and that we should look at changing the rules at staff level. Okay, great. Commissioner Jefferson. I, I also agree it's appropriate. And I did check the proportions, the jam they had to sales, and, and they relate to the, to the existing, so it's very appropriate. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Master. Appropriate, and I agree with all the comments that the other commissioners have made. And Commissioner Holford Smith. I agree, it's appropriate. And I also agree that we should incorporate this as part of the, <coughs> the staff rules. Okay. Sure. All right, great. So I think we have a consensus to approve. Commissioner Chapin, would you read the motion? Uh, <clears throat> yes, and uh, <clears throat> I also agree with the, the rule change uh, being appropriate. That has been, uh, others are uh, uh, suggesting. Uh, in the matter of a certificate of appropriateness for Brooklyn LPC 2306476 South Portland Avenue, uh, Fort Greene Historic District, an early Italianate style house built in uh, circa 1852, application is to replace windows. I note that the building's style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Fort Greene Historic District. I recommend approval, finding that the work will not eliminate any historic fabric, that the proposed windows will recall the historic windows in terms of configuration, operation details, and finish, that the change in material from wood to me metal clad wood will not be perceptible from the street, and the work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the historic district. Thank you. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? Second. All right, thanks. And Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Master? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With a vote of 10 in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. That's approved. Thank you. And we will consider the recommendation to formulate a rule around this. And we'll now move to the next item. And the next item is public hearing item number two, LPC 23 08590, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 1138, lot three. 597 Vanderbilt Avenue in the Prospect Heights Historic District. This is an Italianate style store and flats building designed by John Doherty and built circa 1878. The application is to construct a rear yard addition. 
And we're just waiting for staff to join. Okay, staff, you now have control of the presentation. You may begin. Oh, hi, uh, Timothy Shaw, preservation staff. Sorry, I believe that the architect was gonna run through this presentation. That was what was listed. Um, are they in the, I just got promoted into the room. So, um, Robert Cody. I'm um, not seeing him on the attendee list. Okay. Uh, let's see. Well, Tim, could you go ahead and uh, run through the presentation? Yeah, I think I can. It's just simple Cody. enough. Sorry. Um, okay, this is um, 597 Vanderbilt Avenue, um, <clears throat> a uh, building on Vanderbilt uh, between Bergen and Dean Streets in the Prospect Heart. Prospect Heights Historic District. These are existing condition photos. This is the um, storefront Inaka here in the center, staff level, I mean, a commission level approval from about 10 or 12 years ago. Um, the application here is to in, uh, construct a one story rear yard addition uh, that will encompass the entire lot of the rear yard. So this is the um, plan of the site showing uh, that it's just at the edge of the historic district. Um, it's in red here. And uh, let's see, this is an aerial view um, and showing the existing conditions. And uh, it is not visible from the street uh, in part due to the, um, the rear building built at 651 Bergen and the new building that was constructed just outside the historic district is 653 Bergen. And we'll get to the um, existing conditions. So you can see at the neighbor 595 already has a full lot addition. And um, more views of the, the rear of the neighbor's rear yards looking north and um, this is looking um, I believe this is looking east um, beyond where their 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 rear yard is just to the right of this photo uh, again uh, existing conditions so this is their building here 597 you can see it's actually one of the only maybe the only house, at least in this little row that still has the intact um, ground floor uh, condition. And so now on to the actual proposal. So you can see here the existing section and the existing rear elevation um, and the proposed plans. And so the proposal is a, as noted, a full uh, full lot addition um, just at the first floor for the commercial space that's there now. And that's the proposal. And I believe if you see, um, just to be, uh, they're, they're actually, um, the changes at the rear facade at the ground floor, they're, they're only I think they're only barely changing the openings. It's the, the existing rear facade is is staying, you know, uh, the the wall is is still staying there. They're just extending back. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Commissioners, do we have any questions? If you don't see any questions, let's move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Gregory Kala to see if we have any testimony. Thank you, Chair Carroll. Uh, we did receive one sign up beforehand. It was from Mary Shuford from PHNDC, but I am not seeing them right now. I'll, I'll give them one more moment. 
Yes, Mary. Oh, yes, Mary Shuford. So I will be promoting you to panelist right now, Mary Shuford. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Um, okay. I'm, I'm also putting myself on my picture on. I hate looking at the blank screen. Um, my name is Mary Shuford. I'm representing the Prospect, ha Prospect Heights Neighborhood Development Council. Um, uh, and we thank you for letting us test, uh, testify. The application is to a full, a full depth rear yard addition to expand the existing restaurant to relocate the kitchen and serving counter from the existing building to the rear of the extension. The existing rear yard balcony and stairs will be removed and replaced by a 29 foot, nine inch deep roof deck on top of the extension. The remaining 20 feet of the rooftop will be used to house refrigeration and HVAC equipment, mm -hmm. as well as the relocated kitchen exhaust. There will be a six foot fence separating the deck from the utility portion of the roof. Otherwise, there will be no other modifications to the exterior, the rear exterior of the building. The addition rooftop will not be visible from any public thoroughfare. There, uh, as was shown, there is another full depth addition to the adjacent building to the north and a very deep but not full addition to the building to the south. Given the circumstances, the full depth of addition in the application would be infill in the rear yard and not create a precedent. The plans also include a lot line window door toward the back of the addition that looks onto a very small area behind the building to the south. PHNDC has objected to lot line windows in the past, most recently in the case of an application for the rear yard extension at 593A Vanderbilt Avenue, two, do two doors to the north. However, in this case, there are no openings from 599 Vanderbilt onto the small space behind that building, nor is the space accessible from the building. Further, the proposed window would provide the only access to the space. Because this is a unique circumstance, PHNDC does not object to this application. Thank you for considering our testimony. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And I see that we have one hand raised to call in number. Uh, I, I believe it is the architect for this project. Is that right, Corey? So I'm going to allow you to speak now. And if you could please state your name for the record and unmute your line, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hi, this is Robert Cody. I'm the, the applicant and the architect. I was connected to the Zoom and then suddenly my internet service went down right as the presentation started. I, I think Tim did a good job of explaining the project and then the additional comments from the community board. I, I don't have anything additional to add. I just wanted to let you know that I was here. Okay, great. Thank you. And if you could just stick around for a minute, we'll see if we have any final questions from the commissioners. Commissioners? Sure. I don't see any questions for you. So, um, um, Gregory, let's keep the applicant in the meeting in the as a panelist if, for now, and then you can continue with the other uh, any other testimony. Okay. So there are no further hands raised, and uh, I, the only testimony I have is that additional is that Brooklyn Community Board Eight recommends approval, and. Uh, also, since they're calling in, I can't promote them to panelists. So uh, I got it. Okay. They're just, uh, they're still in the attendees room. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So I think um, the, we've heard uh, thoughtful testimony all in support. Commissioners, again, are there any final questions before we move to our discussion? All right, I'm going to ask you all to unmute so that we can begin our discussion. And Commissioner Lutfi, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Ginsburg, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And this is for a full lot rear yard edition on uh, Vanderbilt Avenue. And it is 
uh, uh, for a commercial space. And the rear yard is blocked off from the central green space by the row houses that face the side street, and also by flanking deep uh, full height, a uh, full lot, other uh, ones full lot, one story rear yard additions. And so it really is, as the uh, um, testimony stated, sort of infilling a space that is completely surrounded now with a new one-story addition. And this is a typical condition that we see on commercial avenues where row houses have been, uh, have commercial spaces on the ground floor. They've been adapted to have full depth additions. This um, addition would actually uh, meet the rules, I think, in many ways, except for the fact that it fills the entire yard, which the staff is not authorized to approve. Um, it does maintain the existing original rear wall and which creates and just uh, modifying openings to create access into the rear yard addition. So a minimal uh, change to historic fabric. So we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Master, would you be comfortable starting this one? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think that I can find this appropriate. Um, I think that the... Um, the addition, the one-story rear yard addition, I don't think it's visible from any public thoroughfare. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, um, we have the adjacent um, buildings also have a full addition and a partial addition. So um, I think that it would be appropriate. Great, thank you. Vice Chair Bland? I uh, completely agree. I also note that it doesn't affect in any way the uh, green part of the donut. Great, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Uh, I, I, you're breaking up. No, you're muted, yeah. I don't know what's going on, sorry about that. <laughs> no, I agree, it's it's totally appropriate. We, we put many of these. Commissioner Lutby. I agree, it's appropriate. This is a very uh, vibrant commercial strip full of restaurants and uh, retail and, <clears throat> Where there aren't additions like this, there are oftentimes um, restaurants utilizing their backyard to expand their space. Um, so as everyone said, it's uh, not visible and uh, approvable. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Jefferson. Appropriate. Commissioner Ginsburg. Appropriate. Commissioner Halford-Smith. Appropriate. Commissioner Chapin. Appropriate. And Commissioner Chen. In agreement. Okay, great. So I think we're all in agreement. Commissioner Master, would you read the motion? Sure. In the matter of, um, let's see, LPC uh, 127106. Oh, wait, hold on. Um, LPC 2308590, um, 597 Vanderbilt Avenue in the Prospect Heights Historic District, an Italianate style store and flats building designed by John Doherty and built circa 1878. Application is to construct a rear yard addition. I note that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Prospect Heights Historic District. I recommend approval finding that the proposed work will not damage or eliminate any significant architectural or historic features of the building, that the proposed one-story rear yard addition will not be visible from any public thoroughfare, that the addition will be located at a corner of the block adjacent to the other rear yard additions and buildings that surround the rear yard and therefore will not diminish a cohesive central green space and that the work will not detract from the special architectural or historic character of the Prospect Heights Historic District. Thank you. And Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? Second. All right, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. 
Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Master? Aye. Commissioner Holford-Smith? Aye. With 10 in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. All right, that's approved, thank you. And we'll move to the next item. The next item is public hearing item number three, LPC 22-1801. This is an application for a binding report in the borough of the Bronx, block 2462, lot one, 1040 Grand Concourse, the Bronx Museum of the Arts and the Grand Concourse Historic District. Uh, this is a museum originally built as a synagogue and community hall designed by Simon B. Zelnick and built in 1961, and later altered and expanded by Castro Blanco, Piscinieri and Associates in 1988. The application is to demolish, alter, and redesign portions of the building and site. And commissioners, the uh, applicants have joined the hearing. Uh, just a reminder to attendees to please accept the promote to panelist prompt when you see it. Um, you now have control of the slides uh, and you may begin. Sorry, I couldn't find the on mute button. Okay. Anya, you just need to click on the screen and you can advance the slides. There we go. Okay. Um, do we have SAG aiders from EDC on our on our team signed up? Sorry, he's just been promoted to panelist. So okay, great. Be here. Thank you. Hey everyone, can you see me and hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Zach Aders. I'm a vice president at the New York City Economic Development Corporation, who's managing the design and construction of this project on behalf of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and the Bronx Museum of the Arts. Uh, we're thrilled to bring this project, uh, this very important project to the commission alongside our project partners and design team led by Marvel. This is one of many projects bringing a long overdue investment and attention to the Bronx. And with a history of project experience in the Bronx, our team has continued to build an understanding of the identity of this region. As you'll see in the presentation, um, identity and connection are two of many key ideas of this project. The project reflects the identity of the Lower Bronx community and makes meaningful connections to its individuals, often ones who feel overlooked by cultural institutions. These ideas and others form this key investment that is responsive to the community that it serves. Uh, thank you so much for having us and I'll pass it over to the Bronx Museum of the Arts. Good, Good morning, commissioners, can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Claudio Rodriguez. I am the executive director of the Bronx Museum of the Arts and on behalf of my entire staff, Board Chair Joe Mizzi and the rest of the board of the museum are really excited to present this to you and to get this long, long in the making project, uh, transformational project off the ground. Um, the opening of this new edition is going to open up the museum's reach. Uh, it's going to allow us to amplify our ability to educate and, and, and to really expand our programming for the community. It's going to be a critical gathering space for this for, the, for this community, a place of much needed for the community. It's um, We're hoping it's going to be an iconic beacon for the Bronx, a place for safety and comfort and pride for the entire community of the Bronx. So I'm really excited to uh, to present to you what, what we've been working on. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Hey, thank you, Claudio. Thank my, you. Name is, my name is Ania Ramirez. Uh, I'm an architect at Marvel and I've been uh, leading this project alongside with Jonathan Marvel. I will pres be presenting the beginning of, of our presentation and Jonathan will follow with the design portion. I need to get acquainted with the clicker, so. Okay. <laughs> As expressed by Zach Aders and Claudio, um, this building is intended to be a celebration of the Bronx. Um, and we, we wanna start with that, um, with that feeling of this presentation. Bronx Museum is located in the Grand Concourse um, alongside uh, many other uh, institutions. And it's 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 no uh, it's no uh, it's no surprise that so many institutions are located in, within the Grand Conference District, as it it was and it has been a very prominent uh, portion of the Bronx 
uh, to this day and will continue to be. Um, our project is located and in the historic district, uh, which was designated in 2011. And in the vicinity of, uh, of the Bronx Museum, uh, we do find um, a significant amount of uh, public institutions and private institutions um, you know, within a five minute walking radius. We have parks and we have, uh, we have a, a very uh, vital uh, cross intersection um, leading you to the Yankee Stadium. Located at the junction of the Grand Concourse and 165, as I mentioned, um, we, we really encounter ourselves in a very wide boulevard, uh, a very highly trafficked location, which uh, allows for a lot of visibility uh, of our museum. It was not until um, really the 60s uh, in which uh, a synagogue, which you will see shortly, uh, emerged out of this corner. But uh, you see here from our archival um, photograph, there was really no development prior to that. I'm going to speak a little bit of the history of the of the of the building itself, um, which in 1961 uh, became a synagogue uh, designed by Simon Bell Selnick. Uh, due to the nature of the district, uh, the Grand Concourse and its importance to the Bronx, um, in the late 80s, uh, the property was acquired by the city and made it into a museum of the arts uh, by Castro Branco Prisionelli and Associates, uh, which is a very notable uh, architect uh, of that time. The needs and the growth of the museum um, led to an expansion uh, to what we call the North Wing, uh, designed by Architectonica and completed in 2006. There's some visuals on, on the evolution of the building and the addition. Our project, as you might heard, it's really on the south portion of the, of the museum. But the really the museum constitutes uh, it's two buildings uh, separated by different eras, different functions. And starting with the 1040 Grand Concourse address, uh, based on the LBC designation report, um, the designation report doesn't identify any um, contributing style to it. A little bit of the uh, description of the building. Uh, we find ourselves with dark red, gray metal panels, gray stone at the elevator course, a glass, a very noticeable glass atrium uh, and river windows on the south facade. Over the years, the building has gone uh, significant renovations and expansions uh, with really not a, not a clear style or not a clear uh, direction. Uh, it was, it's been more based on needs. Uh, in contrast, um, based on the 2011 uh, designation report, the Western facade of the uh, 2006 edition uh, was uh, denoted uh, a style, which is contemporary, uh, which uh, we, are, uh, we will be addressing in our design. A little bit of the of the architecture of that uh, of that building. Uh, it's worth noting that the other facades of the of the building were not uh, designated with a style, uh, only the western facade. And the materials uh, of the facade are prevalent uh, aluminum metal panel. Um, on the on the sides, so we have some CMU painted walls, and we have some windows that are um, sort of creating vantage points uh, towards the the district. Uh, north and south. But the visibility towards the interior is limited. And even though there is a marquee, the, uh, you know, highlighting the entry point, it's relatively low in scale uh, when compared to other buildings in the district, as well as in the relative monumentality of this building. Okay, so for our project, as I mentioned, our main scope is really to address the south, uh, the south corner uh, of, of the south wing. Yeah. 
by helping to create a Bronx identity and a place for the community of the Bronx. Uh, for a long time, this building has, um, you know, felt relatively closed out to the community, and we were tasked to revisit that feeling. Um, to reimagine the museum experience from the street and blur the threshold between the inside and out. In addition, we create an accessible circuit uh, to, influence, to influence the patterns of movement to create different experiences once you are in the museum. We are intending to make it adaptable and flexible for the future generations. And last but not least, design something to be built and to be uh, on the budget that we has been allocated. Marble utilizes uh, physical models and you will see later on in our presentation, um, but just for the clarity and, and you know, understanding of everyone's uh, design process, here you can see more in detail the actual project scope in which we are you know, facilitating some access between the North Wing and the South Wing, which is currently only through one door. Uh, we're creating a, a, a few more openings. Uh, in the interior. Um, we are addressing the front of the Grand Concourse as well, 165th. We are allowing flexible space uh, on, more, on more areas of the building and rethinking uh, more equitable circulation. In terms of our formal concepts, uh, we intended to celebrate the corner as a tie together of the building campus, blend the boundary, bring the street into the gallery, uh, create a museum transparency, bringing gallery to the street, and uh, work on a free circulation that creates a continuous gallery loop. I'm gonna speak a little bit of the Grand Concourse Historic District. As some of, my, of you might know, uh, the Grand Concourse uh, was really designed in the late 1800s, uh, resembling uh, the idea of the Champs-Élysées. But quickly, the district took a, a, a different route. And in the, in the early 20th century and mid 20th century, it took a, a, its own character and uh, it quickly became a residential hub uh, to move uh, into the Bronx. Very vibrant and full of uh, a lot of diverse institutions uh, to support uh, this community. In looking at the district, uh, we can we are we find um, some similarities in the in the buildings. Uh, one of them uh, is uh, that intent of receding um, at the entry points, um, and this happens uh, on institutional buildings as well and on residential. It is a typical um, Art Deco move, and it was popularized in this district. Additionally. Um, the Art Deco brings to this district um, an influence on the use of bronze metals um, and the use of color and articulation to celebrate uh, entry points and, and presence on the street. Marquees are also a signature of, of these grand conquerors. Uh, we have identified a series of them in which um, it's, so its main purpose is to demarcate an entry point, um, reaching out into the street of this Grand Boulevard. The Grand Concourse is no stranger to institutional buildings and civic ones that are monumental in nature, um, creating a mark uh, of, of a, a sort of a reference point uh, in the long district. And next door, uh, we do have a few neighbors, as I, as I noted earlier, uh, that are more institutional in nature, uh, but, but do present uh, a different variations of, of the Grand Concourse, um, and also pointing out different eras. Going into the building, um, we find ourselves with a palette of metal panels from the North Wing, um, some glazing uh, that varies in color from the North Wing and the South Wing. Um, a dark metal panel, stone panel, and a bronze-like uh, placing for the south wing. And here you see a 160 feet as, as well, which is mostly uh, populated by the Blanco Castro Pisionelli evolution of the building. 
some views looking north, getting closer to the museum corner that we are uh, intervening, approaching from 165th Street, noting the, the change in topography uh, to the east of our project. Coming down uh, from one uh, from the Grand Concourse, uh, the train station, into the museum, and then arriving to the Bronx Museum North Wing, which it is our understanding that the facade is being designated uh, as a contributing um, element of the district. Just to frame this and we'll move to the design portion. Um, this is an R8 district, which is a high density district. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that we are all aware of that. And now we're gonna be um, moving on to the design, which is what I'm sure you are very eager to, to hear about. Jonathan. Thank you, Anya, and good morning, commissioners. My name is Jonathan Marvel. I'm a principal at Marvel and um, delighted to talk to you and, and about our ideas for the Bronx Museum of Art on Grand Concourse and 165th Street. As you, as you all know, the Grand Concourse is one of the great urban spaces in New York City. It certainly is one of the wonderful moments within the Bronx's many architectural urban gestures. And it is of note, uh, largely built out during that golden age of the Art Deco. So there's a lot of wonderful ornamentation and detail uh, for the pedestrian as you walk down the on, at grade. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a busy architectural uh, series of gestures on, on our particular immediate block. Um, as Anya pointed out, we have uh, buildings in the, the dashed areas here Note the the family courthouses to the north, the north wing, and and the and the residential building to the south, all of which have a a, a non Art Deco capacity. So I, that that really gave us some cues as to how we can uh, approach this building, uh, not literally with the Art Deco detailing in mind, but taking some of its color, some of its materiality, and 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 certainly the the that wonderful, the uh, recessed entry door that that is is such a, a, a subtle but 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 wonderful thing that ties the entire Grand Concourse together. Um, and uh, one very uh, respectful way that we're approaching this building is um, doing a little archaeology. The reason why it did not get an apartment building built onto it and the in the 20s is because of the bedrock that that prominently sits on this very corner and uh, it was only that later in 1961 that a synagogue was built there um, and and then got the Castro Blanco Piscineri edition um, sort of celebrated the corner Arquitectonica came in to, and and designed a, a very iconic gestural building to the north and so our job from the very beginning, um, as Anya pointed out, we wanted to bring the the vitality of the of the community uh, and into into the architecture and and celebrating the sidewalk into the galleries and the galleries out into the sidewalk has stayed with us, creating a, a very important flexible project room on the corner so the curators um, can 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 have a lot of um, opportunities to to really direct the 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 art artistic energy to the street. Um, and, the, and so in this diagram, what, what is clearly our, uh, a gesture that we're making a nod to um, is the folded plate of the North Wing. Uh, and, and we decided that, uh, it, which is a very strong vertical move. We, uh, at the corner on the other hand, it's a very horizontal infill moment where we're holding the street wall in, in a kind of a good urban way where we're, we're infilling every possible square foot to hold that street wall in the corner and then take the folded plate and turn it horizontally so that we have two folded plate rooftops that 
where they overlap becomes the entry condition. So we don't need a lot of signage to tell the visitor where the entry condition is. And, and it really alleviates a lot of the pressure that the, that the institution has right now. It's very hard to find the front door. So as you can see in the, in the lower elevation rendering, um, where the two roofs meet um, is also supported by where these two trapezoidal walls, which are floating on the storefront, um, where they where they where they start to intersect is also marking helping mark that entry point. So you get the shadow lines of the roof, you get the shadow lines of the of these trapezoidal walls, which are uh, GFRC um, panels, uh, and 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 very simply uh, reducing the materiality to these three. Uh, um, uh, elements, the rooftop, the panels, and the storefront um, is, is something that we're very conscious of, trying to keep it simple, uh, letting the architecture do the celebration of the corner for the community, and then flanking the, the, the building, the, the new uh, infill, uh, are these white walls uh, on, the, on the right. Our, our proposition is to peel off the the gray metal panel and paint the and 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 expose the original synagogue brick and paint that white and at the same time on the north wing of the Architectonica building what is now uh, a CMU wall with a very minor um, uh, change in in pattern and horizontally about in the middle of the wall uh, is to is to give it a light uh, almost a, a, a whitewashing so that some of the the texture comes through, but it's but let the CMU uh, stay CMU, um, and then and that way that wall can be used curatorially for uh, movies at nighttime or a a big banner or a mural, uh, something that that the the museum wants to build into their into their uh, expression of of bring the art to the public, um, and the so from the north looking south at the corner. Giving giving it a strong uh, corner is is amidst this this uh, you know one once in it, in all of the grand conquerors you get the architectonica to the north and that residential building to the south uh, you know we, this is a, a a fairly eclectic corner so uh, the, this gesture is trying to anchor that corner with its own vocabulary picking up. Uh, some of the DNA of, of the building and also the Grand Concourse. One, one thing to point out is, as we continue the discussion is that I mentioned we're doing some archaeology. So the original synagogue, uh, which was then clad later on by Castro Blanco, we're peeling off all the cladding. We're removing all of the, uh, the planters and all those gestures. And then so that the infill corner condition we can occupy all of that square footage with public spaces, and 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 in this view, you can see um, that glazed portion uh, is a is a cafeteria. It's more like a coffee shop type of thing. It's not a restaurant. It's it's a it's a supporting uh, food and beverage for the museum. Um, not it'll be serving prepared foods. They won't be preparing it there. It's not won't have a big kitchen. Just a warm up situation. So, but but we all realize that we need that kind of uh, dynamic way to linger uh, as part of the entry condition for, for the museum itself. The materials that, that are existing that Anya mentioned, um, the iconic uh, Architectonica is a mill finish aluminum, that, that CMU block pattern you can see to the right of the aluminum, it's a center center uh, upper row and then the metal panel on the on the upper right is what we're going to peel off to expose the brick of which we which we intend to paint um, white so it can then work with the the palette uh, on the on the campus and then the proposed material are with our strong suit um, of the the folded plate roof element which is something that that is an incredible material uh, that we're proposing. And here's a, a beautiful sample of it. It's 90% copper, 10% zinc. So it will not, uh, it will not oxidize and it has a, an orbital finish. We'll be sealing it. And so this is 
This will be on the, um, of, of it's, and it's color, hard to see it in, in this without daylight, but it has a, a very warm glow to it. And it would be on the roof, in the soffit uh, interior, as well as on the, the fascia. So it, it, it'll, it will be a, uh, a material that will be seen from the sidewalk. It'll be seen inside the project room and, and the, the cafe, as well as from the rooftops of the adjacent buildings. And, and we know that the Bronx Museum has, has zoning FAR available. Uh, years later, the, the, I think the intention is to keep on building on their site. Um, and so looking down on this roof on the corner will certainly be uh, a long-term investment that, that the museum is, would like to make right now. Um, in addition to that, that uh, rooftop, which is floating on top of a glass storefront with steel um, columns and, uh, and, and mullions, um, we have a GFRC panel, which is a, uh, and, and this is a, a, a small, sample of it. It has a diagonal uh, pattern that runs through the, the rectangle. It's four feet by 10 feet, and it will be um, precast and, and uh, a smooth finish so that we can, um, we, can we can coat it with an anti-graffiti paint. We can also power wash it. It's an integral material, and, and it will be a staggered um, panel system that, that floats uh, off of the structural system, it touches the ground, um, and it does that on the inside. It'll have sheetrock, so it becomes part of the project room for displaying purposes. And the um, uh, of note on on the in terms of the archaeology, the 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 synagogue which was clad, we'd like to unclad it and then paint the brick white uh, and. And then you, which will be housing administrative offices. And so here's a, a sample of a white painted brick. It'll, it'll be able to tie into the, to the north wing. Uh, again, uh, this is a, meant to, to sort of whole, host all the, the, the periods of history to a certain degree um, that the building has, has had and as it's transformed the corner in the past 60 years. And the, the um, that, that 165th Street wing um, will house administrative offices and studios. Um, and then this is the, uh, the, the, the north wing with its, with its CMU block uh, to, to prepare it uh, in such a way that ties in those, those south facing walls, uh, both the administrative wing that you just saw and this one. Um, and, and another uh, element that we'd like to do some archaeology on is, is the, the sidewalk on 165th Street, which gets a lot of foot traffic, uh, which we have now on the inside program with studios on the lower floors and administrative offices upstairs. And the we'd like to remove the planters and, and open up the sidewalk so that you can see how the building meets the sidewalk, use that sidewalk and as public space, it's valuable public space and, and allow the building to engage the, the street. And, and from this view, looking west, you'll see that canopy, uh, that, that marquee, the roof becomes essentially a marquee that turns the corner with that uh, copper zinc uh, cladding. And, and so this kind of summarizes the materials that we'd like to use. It, it uh, rein, reinforces the corner, holding the street wall, lots of glazing so that you can have a CNBC an opportunity, look into the galleries, look from the galleries out into the street and with the carefully chosen openings, the, the roof floats off of the, off this, the, uh, the GFRC panels in, in, a, in, a, in a consistent dimension so that there's a, a kind of an evenness about how that roof uh, uh, addre and addresses the the facade and 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 I think the the last view is the um, in the evening uh, as as we know uh, so many of the events within the museum take place in the evening uh, it's open open to the public all day long for school groups largely and and community people but in the evening it's when all the events and activities takes place so that this illuminated uh, canopy rooftop uh, color starts to really become the signature moment, holding the corner, uh, marking the entry point, uh, showing off the galleries from, from, from the Grand Concourse, 
and 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 talking to the scale, the different scales that that a museum uh, like this needs to talk to the neighborhood, the community, the Bronx, the and and the 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 the, the museums across the world all are are uh, able to express themselves. I think that we work very carefully with Claudio and and his team at the Bronx Museum and Joe Mizzi is the chair. I think we're, we're all very excited to, to talk to you about, about this design today. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions at this time. Um, so why don't we move to public testimony? We may have questions after that. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand so we can identify you. We will, as always, start with anyone who signed up in advance and then get to everyone else. Um, but please raise your hand whether or not you signed up in advance so we can identify everybody who wishes to speak. But I will turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through the testimony. Okay. Thank you, Chair Carroll. We received a few signups beforehand, so we'll be hearing from them first. Uh, the first sign up we have is from Shirley Solomon, who will be reading testimony from both uh, Bronx Borough President Vanessa Gibson and City Council Member Althea Stevens. So, Shirley Solomon, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please state your name for the record and unmute your line, you'll have six minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, thank you again. My name is Shirley Solomon, Bronx Museum of the Arts, and I would first start with the letter that we see in support from the Bronx Borough President. Um, I am writing in support of the proposed renovations to the south wing of the Bronx Museum of the Arts, as it is currently proposed. In my current role as Borough President, as well as my former role as the Council Member of District 16, where the museum is located, I have been briefed on the project and have reviewed the proposed renderings, and I am supportive of this design. The Bronx Museum of the Arts was founded in 1971 and has been on the ground concourse since 1983, serving as an internationally recognized cultural destination. The proposed renovation to the Bronx Museum will allow the museum to serve more children and families while ensuring the arts can continue to be a powerful tool for sharing Bronx history, supporting education, and promoting diversity and inclusivity. It is important that the renovations create new and enhanced cultural space that will support the history and legacy of the Bronx while revitalizing the existing museum. I want to applaud Marvel Architects for meeting this challenge and finding ways the renovated space will function to support the diverse types of exhibits that will be on display. From an aesthetics perspective, I believe the proposed building will stand out in a way that will be that will complement the surrounding neighborhood and this design will enhance the Grand Concourse Historic District. I am requesting that the Landmark Preservation Commission support and approve this design so that con construction can begin and the museum can stay on track for a 2025 reopening. Any deviation from the present plans will cause both financial and programmatic problems for the project. The Bronx Museum of the Arts has worked tirelessly to bring this project to fruition and I urge the approvals by the LPC be granted expeditiously. Thank you to Chair Carroll and members of the Landmarks Preservation Commission for considering my testimony in support of the current proposal. That's that, and then I'll move on to the uh, the um, letter of support received from City Council Member Althea Stevens, who represents the 16th District in the Borough of the Bronx. Dear LPC commissioners, I am writing this letter to express my support and enthusiasm, enthusiasm for the renovation of the South Wing of the Bronx Museum of the Arts. This project will set, is set to unveil the uh, potential of this longstanding cultural institutions and showcase its programs and exhibitions to local citywide and international audiences. It fills me with pride that this public, public institution is one of the few in, York, in city of New York to offer free admission and the new architecture will embody the spirit of the Bronx, providing a warm and inviting space that uplifts its people and is accessible to all. I have been brief on the project throughout the design process and have no doubts that it will bring a much needed upgrade for their location and will work within the landmark district. 
With this renovation, museum experience will feel more whole and cohesive and will leave behind the days of having a disjointed uh, building and campus. And with warm regards, Council Member Althea Stevens, District 16 of the Bronx. And that concludes my testimony. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Rachel Morris, representing Assemblymember Joyner's office. So Rachel Morris, I will be promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hello, um, uh, my name is Rachel Morris and I am submitting this testimony on behalf of Assemblywoman Latoya Joyner and her more than 130,000 constituents in the Claremont, Concourse, High Bridge, Mount Eden and Morris Heights section of the Bronx. Chairperson Sarah Carroll and members of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Committee the new renovation of the South Wing of the Bronx Museum of Art of the Arts is a project that will unveil the untapped potential of this long-standing cultural institution and showcase its programs and exhibitions to a local, citywide, and international audience. The architectural design will serve to highlight the museum as an invaluable cultural asset and enhance resident pride in the local concourse community. As you may know, the Bronx Museum of the Arts is one of the few public institutions in the city of New York to offer free admission and the new architecture truly embodies the spirit of the Bronx, providing a warm and inviting space that uplifts its people and is accessible to all. Assemblywoman Joyner has been kept well informed of the project throughout the design process, and she strongly believes that it will bring a much needed upgrade for the location and work well within the landmark district. With this renovation, the museum experience will feel more whole and will leave behind the days of having a disjointed image. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Lucy Levine from the Historic Districts Council. So Lucy Levine, I'll be promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hi, commissioners. My name is Lucy Levine. I'm speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HTC understands the need to create a new entrance pavilion here and does not object to a new building in this location. We understand that the proposed roof line is supposed to relate to the museum's 2006 North Wing facade, but find this relationship to be insufficiently clear, especially from a street level perspective. We feel that the roof line should be more dynamic and relate more clearly to the 2006 edition and to the immediately adjacent executive towers. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And I am looking through our list of attendees and I do not see any other hands raised. So I will just note for the record that Bronx Community Board 4 recommends approval. And we also received uh, letters of recommending approval from seven individuals. So I will bring the everything back to you, Chair Carroll. Thank you very much. All right, I'd like to turn to the applicant team and ask if you'd like to respond to any of the testimony. Uh, the vast majority of it was supportive, but there were some comments about the relationship between the new design and the existing building. Um, thank, thank you, Chair Carroll. Um, I would like to just add uh, one, one more uh, comment, which is use and, and like to use the model that, that is uh, next to me, um, when my model team is very eager to to put this on display. Um, if you can see, the um, my hand is on the the middle folded plate rooftop, and and this is the 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 Jonathan. Jonathan, move, yes. move the camera a little bit to your right, so okay. you're not in it. Okay. There we go. I think. Okay. Yes. Um, so the the copper clad rooftop. Uh, folded plate element that you'll be able to see from inside. You'll see the, the trapezoidal diagonal running down the middle of that space. Um, it is very much intended to be a part of the vocabulary of the North Wing and um, in both its metallic nature uh, as well as in uh, its proportions as a linear element. Um, the fact that it's horizontal and not, we're not giving it away from the very get-go I think is uh, is an, an important um, idea that that we're taking uh, the folded element and we're transforming it so that it really becomes part of the the overall corner. Um, 
if, I think if we were to literally take that folded plate system and run it as a uh, as a zigzag, I think it would be too busy, too self-referential. And this uh, this opens the idea that that the museum is 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 holding the corner. It's it's fully accessible right from the sidewalk. And I think that that it's a welcoming gesture to to bring you straight into the to the to the galleries uh, where the two plates meet. So I, that's that would be. Uh, I, I hope that that is uh, that resonates architecturally anyway with with the um, with the North Wing as a gesture, but not completely trying to copy it. All right, thank you, commissioners. Do we have any final questions? I do want to note that we have, I think, a hand still raised in the attendees list. So, Gregory, is that? Do you want to just check and see if there's an additional speaker? Uh, yes. So I see S. Goodman is, has raised their hand. Uh, they did not sign up to speak beforehand, but I will promote them to panelist right now. So S. Goodman, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. So if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Sam Goodman. I work with the Bronx Borough President's Office. I also am a resident of the Grand Concourse and very familiar with this location. The Bronx Museum of the Arts has been a very important institution for all of us who live uh, in this community, as well as for the city as a whole. I'm very personally, I'm speaking as a resident of the community, not representing President Gibson. I have one question and then a bit of a concern that I'd like to share and I would appreciate response to. And that pertains to the building on 165th Street and your, your stated plan to paint the brick white. I'm concerned that over time that might in fact pose an ongoing maintenance challenge. And I'd like to be able to know from the architect exactly how that facade could be properly maintained so that the white remains white and doesn't wind up turning gray and dingy looking 10 or 15 years later from now. Can anyone please respond to that point? Okay, well, what we do, we will take your full testimony and then we'll go back to the applicant to respond. So okay, you, that, you, that, yeah. th that's it. I just want to just have that one quick question. That's okay. all I have to ask. All right, great. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for your testimony then. All right. Now, Jonathan, do you want to respond to that? Th thank you, Chair Carl, and thank you, Mr. Goodman. Uh, your concerns are valid. Uh, this is a stain white uh, coating that it's going to get, and it's I uh, over 35 years practicing in New York. It's the best way is to with paint, the, which are fantastic these days, um, this will this will be a paint that will have a, a long lifespan. It's a paint that you can paint over quite easily. Um, it, it's a great way to uh, to keep the facade clean if it gets tagged on the ground floor. Easy to um, to maintain, uh, and and it can be washed uh, if it does get. Uh, gray with soot as as buildings tend to do uh, they require anything requires maintenance whether it's uh, whatever color whatever material uh, these it'll it'll but it'll stand up over time and it's and it, and it's a very uh, affordable way to to tie the campus together with the other masonry uh, facades and and walls okay thank you All right commissioners Again, any final questions, please uh, raise your hand if you want to ask the team anything at this time before we begin to comment. All right, I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm going to ask you all to unmute so we can close the hearing and begin our discussion. All right, Commissioner Halpert Smith, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, 
hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion now. And I think as was stated in the presentation, but I think also reflective in the test reflected in the testimony is um, this is a really important institution to the Bronx and to the city as a whole. And um, and I think that changes to embrace the community and open it up and make it more welcoming are um, all really going to not only benefit the institution, but really benefit the city. And so I applaud the efforts here by everybody on the team. Um, the, the corner building, as we've heard, is a, identified as a non-contributing building in our designation report. So the proposal is to replace that portion of the building with um, a new exterior that would connect to the remaining portions of the building and achieve many goals in terms of uh, design and but also identity and placemaking and uh, engaging the community. Um, so we'll begin our discussion now. Vice Chair Bland, would you like to start this one? I'd love to. Um, the, the more I study this and the more I think about it, the better it gets. I think this is a very, very interesting uh, uh, response to uh, an eclectic um, corner, um, a, a, a series of, of uh, discordant, one might say, uh, 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 buildings, which are being brought into a whole, but without, <clears throat> um, without an overarching uh, heavy, heaviness uh, uh, or simplicity to that uh, idea. Um, so they, we still have three distinct buildings. Uh, and I think that's um, kind of inevitable for one thing, but I think it's also perhaps not a bad thing. Uh, it, it sort of reflects the dynamism of this corner. Um, the, um, the, the folded plate idea, I think, is taking the vertical architectonica folded plate and then making it horizontal and sloping it up like this at the corner is really quite inspiring. Uh, and the, the, the copper zinc combo, uh, which will not patinate is also, I think, uh, a terrific touch here. Um, to say that this enlivens the street is uh, kind of an understatement. I think it uh, brings a whole new dynamism to the corner and an expression of inclusion, which is, I think, part of what um, the museum director spoke of and, and Jonathan has also spoke of as his desire to, uh, to create um, an, a welcoming inclusionary sort of an idea, a peek in to see what's happening Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, so I'm really, I'm really loath to um, to fiddle around with the details in any way through my commentary. Not that I have the ability <clears throat> to fiddle around with them, uh, absolutely. Uh, but I think uh, this is a very personal, idiosyncratic um, <clears throat> move by a, a, an excellent architect. So I don't have significant issues at all. Um, but I do have three kind of insignificant issues that I'll just bring up, and they, they involve surfaces. Um, I wonder a little bit about the white stain, I guess it is, uh, CMU wall on the north face of the uh, Architectonica building. Um, I just wonder about it. I'm not sure I'm against it, just wondering about it. Would it be better to coat it with something that's... Uh, and CMU is in the eye of the beholder, maybe uh, Lou Kahn back then, we loved it, but it's a little hard to, to, to it's baggage, I think, in our imagery. So if we see too much of that, it might detract. Um, the, um, the, the idea of removing on the, on the former synagogue side, the 165th Street side, removing that uh, vegetation to let the um, sidewalk go right up to the building is a very inspired idea and a good idea. Um, and it just brings to my mind that the sidewalk itself, it now as a, as a horizontal plane, might be um, a place for an interesting uh, 
response, artistic uh, response, as opposed to just um, tinted concrete or something that it, it it's crying out for for something uh, of the arts, I think. And the third is I'll um, um, I will uh, also uh, suggest my reservations as expressed by that last speaker about a, an overly white, I'll just say overly white, bright white, and I'm not sure what exact, you know, white is white is white, uh, many, many whites. Uh, and I think this building, if it's too white, will show dirt really quickly. And uh, so I suggest to Jonathan that he may consider a, 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 a grayer shade of white uh, or light. So with that, though, I'm very impressed with this. And I think it's a, a really interesting, inspired, custom fit sort of solution. This There's nothing generic about this. It'll be an icon on this great street um, in the future. Great, thank you very much, Commissioner Goldblum. Thank you. Um, let me say a few things first. I think it's totally appropriate to remove the uh, corner uh, glazed um, construction and modify it. I think that the uh, there's there's nothing but wonderful news about this project in terms of the program, in terms of the plan changes, in terms of the accessibility on the interior, which is very curious. I mean, I've been to this building a number of times, and it's uh, I'm always proud to go there and to see what they have. And it's a wonderful staff. The, cur the curatorial work that they do on a very tight budget is, is really remarkable. Um, the way they serve the community is really remarkable and very important. And I think that this project will enhance that as, as the borough president and the um, uh, council person have, have noted. I think that's all very true. Um, <clears throat> I think that the uh, impulse to expose the original uh, brick on the on the uh, uh, east wing is uh, is commendable. Um, I have trouble though with with a few items here, and no, nothing would make me happier than to love this as it is and to feel that it is totally appropriate to the concourse district. But I really can't feel that way at this time. Um, the reasons. <clears throat> First of all, uh, I, I, I agree with Fred and with Mr. Goodman on the trepidation about the paint on a building that has always struggled with uh, ongoing maintenance, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a neighborhood with a lot of traffic, a lot of, a lot of activity. Mm -hmm. I think it will look bad quickly. Um, uh, and I think that the, you know, I, I recognize that Painting is probably the cheapest way to deal with graffiti and stuff like that, but that's shifting the budget to maintenance from capital. And in my experience anyway, unless this building is different, getting capital money is easier than getting maintenance money. And uh, the likelihood that the building will look dingy well into the future in between periods of maintenance is, is a concern for me especially when the current materials that are on the building, as far as I can tell, and whenever I've been there, uh, uninspiring as they may be, don't appear to be um, uh, tagged or uh, significantly damaged. I haven't looked at them carefully, but the building never struck me as disheveled or, or you know, uh, unkempt. Uh, I worry that the white will allow you to see every little boo-boo and every little degradation Number one. Number two, uh, I think that <clears throat> when we evaluate buildings, new buildings that go into historic districts, the thing that I look for anyway is how a modern building dialogues with the, the significant portions or the significant aspects of the district. Um, for me, this building's form dialogues the most with the executive towers across the street, which is, in my view, a building that is anomalous to the district. It has a kind of Miami modern quality that, uh, while very exuberant and very fun, is not really part of the, the period for which the district was designated or the qualities that people associate with the, with the 
concourse. And the funny thing about the Architectonica project um, is that it does that, I think, a lot better. It, it, what it does is if you look at, if you look at the um, image of the, the aerial image that you showed of the, of the concourse, which I think is on page uh, 25 of your presentation, you see something and your page 26 kind of notes it, that what, what characterizes for me that the district, you know, if you were to kind of boil it down to one or two basic qualities, one of them would be vertical three-dimensional articulation whether it's bay windows or insets, or, I mean, if you look at that streetscape, what you see is a series of vertical stripes and what, you know, and they're, they're created either by, um, you, know, in, you know, insets in the facade or uh, bay windows coming, coming out from a, a plane or courtyards. Um, it's very, very, very much a, you know, if, if you were to do a similar view to West End Avenue or, or Park Avenue, it would be a different picture. <laughs> This district, I think, is characterized by that kind of vertical three-dimensionality. And flipping it on its side, I think, I think that it doesn't read. I think you might read it from the interior. What you read from the, from the outside is an angled roof, you know, kind of very similar to uh, a lot of kind of mid-century modern uh, buildings um, that's seeking to do what a lot of museum additions seek to do, which is to be different than the surroundings, to be a, a kind of a Guggenheim or a, a, a Whitney, as opposed to something that blends in. I don't think that's necessarily a bad uh, role for a, 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 a museum to, to play in, in the urban landscape. But I think here, I don't think it talks to the district. I think it talks to the executive towers across the street, but not to the district as a form. Um, I think also the, the, the idea of entering in the center of the, of the block along the concourse makes a lot of sense from the interior layout perspective. And also from an urban perspective, mm -hmm. having a gallery that opens to the corner, I think is really great. However, I think that, that, I mean, if you were to kind of squint at this building from a distance, I think you'd be looking for the entry at the corner. The, the, the architecture seems to point you to, to an entry at the corner. People are used to entering at the corner. They've been doing it for the last, I don't know, 40 years, 30 years. Um, so I think that there needs to be some way of dealing with that kind of as a volume and an expression that where, you know, and even, even the massing of the building seems to say, this is the most important place. This is where you should look. You know? And maybe that's good that you're looking at the gallery. But I, for me, I think there's a little bit of um, confusion at the corner but that that, that 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 is still the entry. And lastly, I think that the volume and the, the design and the, the materiality, while I think are beautiful, I don't think it serves the goal of uniting the campus as, as, as several people mentioned, and I think as, as uh, Jonathan mentioned, I think it, it very much breaks it away from the campus. Um, you know, whereas perhaps in the past, the panels sought to unite the buildings here, the removal of the panels and the use of new materials really identified that, like, like Fred said, three separate buildings. I don't think there's a lot of uni unification going on. The unification comes through the paint. And I think that the, that's a very thin unification when the volume and the articulation and the scale are all pointing in the other direction. So um, while I really think that there's so much laudable about this project, for me, I cannot support it at, at, at the present time with, with this uh, design. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Ginsburg. Um, I, I tend to agree with Commissioner Bland that uh, uh, I think this is a very hard project in sight in that you're starting out with three distinct buildings and the middle part doesn't work very well. Uh, and uh, in general, I find this approvable. I understand the concern about the flat white and agree with Commissioner Bland that a light grayish white may make sense. And I'm not sure about painting over the CMU on that sidewall, although I do understand the museum wants to be able to project on it and also put um, uh, banners, etc on it, which I think 
makes a lot of sense. But in general, I'm very supportive. And I don't see a way that you could totally unify it or to make this a particularly vertical element given the massing without making a vertical addition, a much bigger vertical addition, which I don't think makes sense. So I, I can support it. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Commissioner Jefferson. Um, I'm gonna base my comments basically on the, com on the composition. And I think the composition makes sense. I think it, it, it holds the corner, the idea of the corner, which is dominant in the party works. I think the big window works. And the, the idea of trying to create a composition out of three separate elements is a difficult one here because the, 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 the new building is essentially a roof building. The roof is the dominant part. And the roof itself angled uh, as a butterfly can't hold together the two, the two wings. Now, I think that can be solved. I think there's a way that perhaps they can extend it more, overlap more, but right now it doesn't do that. The other issue for me is the walls themselves. The, the, the dominant thing is the roof. The walls then are in competition with it. It has cutouts in it, it's exact, the shape of it, the opening, it's competing and it's drawing complete attention to the new building and taking everything away from the two existing buildings. So how do you how do you play that to make the the, the corner building read the most and then give room for the other two? That's the issue that confronts the architects here. And I think they can solve that. I think the the if the entrances are smaller or worked out in a different way, I think there is a possibility for this scheme. And I I I don't think we should. I think the party here can be resolved in a very good architectural way. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. Um, I think and uh, I think that Mark Mark mentioned this, and maybe someone and other people did it as well. Uh, first of all, this is a very exciting project, as everyone has said. It's exciting for the city, it's cultural landscape. This museum is very, very important in terms of its place in the city's <clears throat> uh, cultural sphere. And it's also critical, not only to the cultural community of the Bronx, but the vitality of the Grand Co Concourse. And so, <clears throat> And it's an important punctuation mark within this landscape. And so the this is a very challenging, I think it's a very challenging project and an exciting project at the same time as every as other people have said. And this whole idea of unifying these, uh, I'm gonna say unifying three different structures and then, um, defining the entrance, but but making sure that there's connectivity in a way that makes sense visually and also um, in terms of um, the 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 literal landscape of of the the streetscape is um, is is important and challenging. And I think that the architects had a very um, I'm sure they spent a tremendous amount of time on this because, oh, I just lost my page. You know, can you see me still? Yes, we can see yeah, you. Because I can't see anything now. <laughs> so, so I'm just um, going to speak. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> let me say that I think that um, it, it, so, the, the project is extremely, um, I think it's uh, very successful in terms of, of one of its primary goals. This is not the first museum to have a, um, a problem <laughs> uh, redefining or further defining where the entrance of, uh, 
of the building is. I mean, MoMA had this big problem. Um, and um, and the Brooklyn Museum sort of dealt with this in an in a in an important way. And I think the project is does a, the architect does a very, very good job of saying not only this is where you enter, but in in terms of making the entryway one that is welcoming, one that is porous, one that it engages with the streetscape, and one that as you're passing by, you definitely want to sort of, if not move, go in, go, get closer to see what's going on. I, I want to also say that I I like the um, what happens in this project in the evening, the way um, the the rooftop has that beautiful lighting um, <clears throat> that it accentuates it and defi again defines the entrance um, at this particular point. I I think for me, I think this idea of of making it completely cohesive is impossible. So the question is the connectivity and and uh, and uh, a li and the harmony. Um, and I think my only issue is um, I have two two really. My only issue is maybe the materiality of the rooftop, and I I feel like the this particular material and this particular color are a little, to me, seem a little harsh and a little discordant. And I would like to advise that um, that be looked at um, to see if it can, uh, so that the expression is still there, but so that there's more of a so that it joins better with with the other two space the other two pieces of the project. I also heard the applicant say, and I appreciate this, that this is not only about the present, but it's about making sure that this uh, this complex can be further expanded in the future as it needs to be, and I'm sure that was taken into account with this design. I also um, appreciated um, the comments about the paint and um, its uh, ability to be uh, to wear well over time. And so I, I would love it if the applicant could go back and look at that from a, a color standpoint as well, or just to ensure that that this uh, that that as this project you know, ages over time, it will, it will, it will age well. And, and Fred said one other thing, which I thought was a really terrific idea. And I, I don't, I don't know if I took this very literally, but Fred, if you were saying that it might be nice to have some kind of um, sculptural um, aspect in the front of the in that space in the building that is now more in the in the front of the building that's now more open, I think that would be a wonderful, um, another wonderful punctuation point in addition to the complex. So that's it. Great, thank you very much, Commissioner Holford Smith. Yes, thanks. I agree. This is a very important project for the city um, and an important corner and certainly a very difficult um, problem to solve. Um, but I, I tend to agree with uh, the comments of uh, Commissioner Goldblum, where I, um, I think that the, the, the emphasis on the roof plane um, and the relationship of that roof plane to the architectonica building um, it really won't be perceived from the regular passerby on the street. I think it's something that you see from above. Um, and I think that, that projecting deep overhang is also something that's very atypical of this district. And, um, you know, I, I'm not sure that it, I know its, it's purpose is to try to 
you know, act as these wings that bring the three buildings together. But I feel like in a way it kind of pushes them apart. And perhaps that's also um, accentuated by the, the color and the material that's been chosen, which is very beautiful material, but I'm not sure um, how it really relates to the greater context here and the existing buildings. Um, I think Michael really hit nail on the head when he, when he referenced that photograph of the Grand Concourse as a series of sort of vertical stripes. And that's really what you read is the, <clears throat> the, the building masses, the recessed entries. And it's something that, that the architects referenced in their, um, in their presentation as well, but it doesn't come forward in this design, I don't, I don't feel. Um, and it, even though it seems kind of intuitive, but actually I think it does come, come forward in the Architect Hanukkah edition, even though those planes are all um, set at different angles. Um, so I'm not sure that I'm ready to um, support the application as it is right now. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, well, I'm very interested in the uh, discussion by all the architects. Um, my, I, I think I'm uh, most in sympathy with uh, Commissioner Bland's remarks. Um, and the only, I, I think that the design and the, the way they've used the planes and uh, tried to use the um, materials and color of it in general is trying to is trying to tie the complex together, and I feel they've been you know, largely successful in that. Uh, um, I could support the suggestions about maybe using a great. I was thinking that if the uh, roof, instead of being bronze with a gesture to the Art Deco, since they're just making a ge gesture to the Art Deco in the, in the area, I think is not, isn't really working maybe. And if it were perhaps a gray uh, color and a different material, that that could help to uh, continue the, dialogue they're trying to achieve with the uh, the uh, um, North building uh, the I was not sure about the break in the planes but I think that uh, uh, over the entrance but I think uh, that that can work as part of uh, just stay uh, you know the, their attempt to uh, in a horizontal fashion, try to uh, echo, do some echoes of the North building. In general, I, I think, you know, I pretty much could approve this. And, 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 you know, to me, it's just maybe working on the roof line, uh, the, the materials and the color of that expression, and that that, you know, maybe can respond to some other people's concerns too, I hope. But uh, in general, I think it's, uh, it's uh, I, I think it's rather, it is largely successful in trying to pull the campus together, which I think is important and uh, repositioning the entrance. And, uh, you know, um, I think that the planes vertical and horizontal planes generally do work and the uh, material chosen for the new building and the treatment of that and also of the, um, the synagogue uh, uh, does work for me. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen. Okay. You're speaking, you're muted, Wellington. So I'm, uh, I'm unmuting. Are. Yeah, so um, interesting discussion and interesting comments. Um, the, um, I think the context here, first of all, I think it, it is a wonderful project, uh, however final shape you may come out to be. 
uh, and this is indeed a very important institution. And I guess in a sense of, if you're looking at the context of the Grand Concourse uh, versus a museum, um, museums tend to send out, uh, whether you're Museum of Natural History or has been alluded to Guggenheim. Um, and and, and, and I, I think the, uh, the comments uh, seem to be falling into two camps. Um, the thing that comes to my mind in this sense is more like this is almost like a Le Corbusier, uh, Chappelle, the, uh, the Notre Dame approach, right? Which is that you have a roof line, except it is far more in the hand of a capable architect, far more welcoming rather than a solid wall with a couple of punch openings. This is inviting the public in. It's very, very transparent. And Coming from a culture that appreciate origami, the photo plane to me is intriguing. And I have no problem with the material. I think the material itself is actually quite appropriate. I think I tend to agree with uh, Mark and Vice Chair Bland that to tie it into this corner is not an easy solution. And I think you're in a way um, making reference and context to the other two buildings, the existing buildings, but integrating the corner. And, and by definition, you know, whether you think it as a Guggenheim, whether you're thinking as any museum, it has to stand out in my mind at this moment. I, I don't know how. Uh, uh, and, and so I think that I, I, I I understand this approach and I think it's been used successfully uh, elsewhere. Uh, and I, 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 I also like the fact that they are given the graffiti, they are, they are treating the, the, uh, the surfaces with the, uh, the, the palimphus and, and the ability to power wash, uh, I think like that. So I, I would defer to the other commissioner. I will not play designer um, here. And I, I think the um, it, it's up to the commission. Um, it, uh, this is not a background architecture. Um, and so we had to decide on which side of the camp do we want to fall out of the bed from uh, and then go from there. And I think uh, I'll, I'll defer the detailed comments to, to the rest of the commissioners. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Master. Um, very interesting comments. Um, what a very exciting project. Um, I want to commend the architects um, because they have such a challenging task here to try and, you know, combine these buildings um, and to try and, you know, make this an exciting corner to bring people in um, and to do something innovative. And I like it. Um, I think it's a very challenging task I think a lot of effort was put in and thought in trying to tie this corner, trying to tie elements of the neighborhood and to, uh, I think, make it exciting for people to want to come and visit the museum, to make it welcoming, as Commissioner Chen said, and to raise interest and excitement in this corner. Um, I think it's very difficult to combine, you know, the three buildings. Um, and I know there's also been discussion on the color of the bronze alloy, um, that it really is a new aspect to this building. However, um, I think it's very warm. Um, I think, especially when it's lit at night, um, I think it's very welcoming and warm. So I like the color. Um, so I would find, I, I think I like it. I, I, I can find it appropriate. Okay, thank you very much. All right, commissioners, thank you for your very, very thoughtful comments. I do think that um, the majority of the commissioners are really um, supportive of the approach here um, in terms of having a, a horizontal plane because it is a lower building. It's, it's not a vertical building. Um, and having that uh, roof line work in the way that it does, opening up at the corner and engaging the corner. And um, I think it, it, while, while there's a lot of support um, for that, and I think others have talked about um, that sort of 
lack of verticality and rhythm not working within the, the his larger historic district, um, it does seem that the majority of the commissioners are comfortable with this not being a typical historic district building or having that strong of a dialogue because it already is sort of its own thing as an institution. Um, it already is a different form and stands out in the historic district as do institutions in many of our historic districts. And so I think um, that's why there is support for this approach. Um, but having said that, there were some comments that I think um, it would be great to have a little bit more uh, response to, and that would be the white stain on the CMU, the white paint. Um, some commissioners who were very supportive felt that could be a um, restudied as well and maybe uh, uh, toned down to a grayer color or thinking about the, the uh, longevity of the paint and how that, uh, what the right product is. Um, there were also some questions about the connectivity of the roof to the other two uh, distinct pieces. And um, I think that could be responded who are uh, in terms of thinking about its form, its length. Um, and by, when I say form, I think we were talking about the length and how it connects to the other buildings and or the color. So I think that there's a couple of ways that you can think about how this roof plane can have a stronger connectivity to the rest of the campus. Um, and I think the sidewalk is also an opportunity for some expression for the museum. And I think with some of those refinements, there would be support for this approach. Um, and it may be that in, in thinking through some of these refinements, you also um, find some creative and innovative ways to respond to the rhythm of the street that addresses some of the other comments, the people who were less supportive of the form. So we'll take no action today, but I do think that there is a, um, a, enough support for this approach with some refinements on the finishes and um, the, the connectivity of these elements to the building, to the adjacent buildings. And so we hope that you can make some of those um, changes quickly. I know that they will be thoughtful. You're very thoughtful in all of your work. And we hope to have you back as soon as you're ready. We'll take no action today and we'll see you in the near future. All right, thank you. We'll move to the next item. Okay, and I'm going to thank go you. ahead and read in the next two items as they will be presented together. Uh, starting with item number four, LPC 23-01614, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the Borough of Queens, Block 1290, Lot 49, 3751 and 3755, 79th Street in the Jackson Heights Historic District, a Neo-Tudor style garden apartment building designed by H. Hamilton and built 1925 to 26. Application is to reconstruct and modify a courtyard wall. And uh, public hearing item number five, LPC 23-07281, uh, application for a certificate of appropriateness number of Queens, Block 1290, Lot 29, 3752 at 3756 80th Street in the Jackson Heights Historic District. Also a Neo-Tudor style garden apartment building designed by H. Hamilton, built 1925 to 26. Also the application is to reconstruct and modify a courtyard wall. And commissioners, the uh, applicants have joined the hearing. Uh, you now have control of the presentation. Just click on the screen to activate and advance the slides. Uh, state your name for the record and you may begin. And just remember to also unmute yourself. Oh, and if you could refrain from hitting escape, um, just use your arrow keys or the mouse. Thanks. Can you hear me now? Faintly, could you please speak louder or adjust your microphone? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Jasmine. I am here with uh, EDG and representation of um, SW Management for the project uh, mentioned before, 3755 79th Street and 3756 80th Street. Um, we are looking to um, widen existing archways. So as it was mentioned before, the project is located in Jackson Heights on Roosevelt Avenue between 79th and 80th Street. They are sister buildings on the same tax block. 
Um, um, building was constructed originally in the 1925 through 1926. It is a multifamily residential property here in Jackson Heights. Um, here are typical historic photos for 79th Street. From left to right, you have the 1940s tax photo and the middle 1993 designation photo when it's designated a landmark property. And on the right is a current photo. This is an overall taken recently after our ongoing facade re repair project. This is what the building actually looks like right now after all the repairs that we have done to the building um, with landmark approval. Um, same for 80th Street, on the left, the 1940 tax photo, in the middle, the designation photo, 1993, and on the right, the current photo after our um, also ongoing facade repair project with landmark approval. So here's the location of the proposed repairs. We are proposing to um, repair the archways on both buildings, one on 79th Street and one on 80th Street. These archways um, give access for the rear parking area and maintenance area. This is not a public parking, and it is not a parking for the residents in the building. Uh, for the most part, this area is used by maintenance for the building maintenance and the neighboring buildings. They have um, set for about four to five parking spots here on the south. Um, only for the neighboring buildings um, ownership. So this is the current um, condition of the arch at 79th Street. Originally, our construction drawing showed that we were gonna be replacing marble units as needed and replacing the face brick at the arch during um, construction while the contractor started preparing for this work we were able to see the extent of the damage of the existing brick and marble. Um, the contractors were actually able to remove these bricks by hand. And once we noticed the extent of the deviation, we stopped all demolition. The arches are currently um, shored, and this is the existing condition. No more work has been done. As you can see in the photos, the brick was completely rotted, as well as the majority of the um, marble stones around the arches. Also, we have the, the gate in the middle of the arch. So this arch leads into the back courtyard and connects to the 80th Street Arch. This is the arch over at 80th Street, which you can see has been stuccoed or coated over the years. Um, light demolition had, had begun also over the sidewalk shed, but we had stopped immediately and it is not being short is not necessary at the moment, and um, we haven't done any more work here also. So here we have the existing versus the proposed. On the left-hand side, this is for 79th Street. On the left-hand side, you can see the sketch of the, of the existing arch as is, and on the right, we are noting um, which stones we would we need to replace um, and how we're gonna be expanding the arch. Our plan is to expand the arch one foot towards the right um, by, by uh, making the wall on the, on the right slightly smaller and also by reducing the size of the gate, um, of the existing gate. And also by, by adjusting the size of all of the stones, these seven stones on the top of the arch. These stones will be slightly bigger the plan is to make all the stones slightly bigger in a way that it won't be so noticeable um, and to keep the shape of the existing arch to match as much as possible. Here you can also see um, how we're representing the pins that are gonna be installed to, um, to install the new stones. We're trying to salvage as many existing stones as possible. The ones that are noted on the drawings are the ones that we know that need to be replaced due to the extent of the damage that they have right now. Similarly, this is for 80, 80th Street, but we will be extending the wall to the left 
existing right now, there was a brick wall between the arch and the neighboring property, which is also um, an S SW management property. So the plan is to demo this left side wall to extend our arch and replace with an offense to match existing. We are also going to be modifying slightly this, the size of the stones on top of the arch. The idea here is to allow for proper car um, access. Right now, the arches are about eight feet wide, but with the gate, it, it is limited to seven foot six inches, which is a very tight fit for cars. The standard lane size and parking size for, um, for vehicles is nine feet. So right now we're just looking to expand it to allow for proper um, access to the area. We will also be um, rebuilding half of the arch on 80th Street on the north side. Um, half of the arch belongs to the neighboring property and the other half belongs to us. We will not be ex expanding the size of any of the arches at this location. We will only be replacing in kind. Here are the sample materials that we are proposing to use. Um, on the top picture, um, we have the brick sample, which was already approved by Landmarks. This is the brick that we have been using at the front of the facade of during the facade repairs. Um, also, we will be using the Glengarry 406 that was also Landmark approved that we have been using on the street elevation. On the bottom, we have the lamb, the marble samples. So the left photo is the a sample of the existing um, marble that was removed from one of the arches, and on the right is the match that we were able to find. So this is the the sample that we want to use. And on the top right, we have a overall detail of how we will be installing these stones. So they'll be installed with quarter inch stainless steel, number four, eight stone anchors and epoxy. Um, also related to the arch replacement um, is going to be the fence that we will be re reinstalling. Um, in the tax photos and the designation photos, which are here, you can see that there's a sunburst design in the steel work on the, in, um, for the fence. Right now we are proposing to maintain the picket design since it is what you'll find down the, on, down the block on neighboring properties. The two pictures on the right are sam examples of neighboring properties that have a picketed fence instead of the sunburst. None of the buildings on, in the neighborhood have the sunburst anymore. So we're proposing to match uh, the, the other neighbors. That is all for my presentation. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions at this time? Yes, Commissioner Chapin. Yes, I just wanted uh, to, to inquire whether you had looked at uh, changing the operation and design of the gate uh, so to minimize the amount of widening you had to do because you say that the operation of the gate currently is part of the issue because it the way it's opening you've got a double you know a double gate as opposed to one swing gate uh, the question is whether there's a way that might uh, give you more room if you uh, did something with the gate that that was the question I had yeah so over in 79th street as you can see in the photo the gate is actually inside of the arch and on 80th street it is on the outside of the arch both arches itself without counting the gate is eight feet wide um and the standard size for vehicles is nine feet. So even if we were to move the gate from 79th Street to the outside of the arch, we will still be a whole foot short 
from the standard size, which will allow the vehicles to come in and out easier. Right now, vehicles do fit, but it is an extremely tight fit, and they'd have to like close their um, the mirrors to properly go in without um, hitting the arches. Yes, uh, thank you. No problem. Okay, other questions? I don't see any other questions at this time, so we'll move to public testimony. If you'd like to speak on this item, please raise your hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through the testimony. Thank you, Chair Carroll. We did not receive any signups beforehand, so I'll give one more moment to the attendees in the meeting to see if anybody wants to raise their hands. Um, okay, I do not see any hands raised. So I will just note for the record that Queens Community Board 3 recommends a, a conditional approval so long as all wrought iron fencing outside of the rebuilt archway wall shall be adjusted to receive new opening infill fencing. And that new and large archway opening due to the proposed expansion shall receive a new wrought iron gate design, which is acceptable to the owner and LPC, not limited to pickets, hardware, and locking devices, et cetera. And I'll bring it back to you, Chair Carol. Okay, thank you very much. So I'd like to turn back to the applicant and ask if you'd like to address the issues raised by the community board. No, we don't have any issues with uh, with their comments. Okay. All right, commissioners, do we have any final questions? All right, I'm gonna ask you all to unmute so that we can close the hearing and move to our discussion. All right, and Commissioner Master, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. So at these two um, properties, the applicant would like to widen the archway to allow uh, vehicles to more easily move through the alleyway between, mm -hmm. and that would involve uh, salvaging and doing some replacement material to enlarge it and uh, replacing the fences to match the existing fences. Um, so I'm going to actually ask uh, Commissioner Chapin if you'd like to start this one since you have the most experience with this district. At a, blo a block away from where I live, and I uh, do walk by there very, very commonly. And unfortunately, there are some situations with stuccoing and parching and uh, things that uh, have been on the front. I noticed some uh, of these buildings, I believe uh, they're also doing some other restorative work, which is good. Um, in any event, um, uh, you know, I can approve this. It's uh, it's a, a minor. Uh, it, it's good to get the stucco removed where it's uh, uh, occurring, and also uh, to uh, if they're going to recapture as much as they can of the brick and the stonework here. There are some little medallions over the door arch, which I, I hope they're going to also preserve or you know replace uh, in kind there uh, because I think that's uh, uh, so not original to what the uh, I think was there, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure at what point those ended up being there, but I think they're kind of typical of the kinds of things you see uh, in the district. So I think, uh, you know, that the description that they've given of how they're going to proceed seems reasonable. And uh, I can understand that uh, because that is a vehicle access that they need enough space to bring the vehicles in. And it is obviously very, very tight. And I think once the work is done, if it's well done working with the staff, that it, the changes will not really be perceptible to anyone uh, walking by. So, uh, you know, I, I can approve it, uh, I think, as presented. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Jefferson? 
Oh, I think it's um, very well done, very well thought through, and I can approve it. Okay, Commissioner Lefty. Yeah, I agree. Um, I love that they're using, they're trying to salvage materials and their presentation was very thoughtful. And I agree uh, with Diana that, you know, they can work with staff on the details to make sure um, it's, uh, it looks as consistent and good as possible. Okay, Commissioner Goldblum. I agree, appropriate. Okay, Vice Chair Bland. Yep, necessary to do it and then very carefully uh, thought through in terms of salvage material, et cetera. Very well done. Okay, Commissioner Ginsburg. Agree, appropriate. Commissioner Master. Appropriate. Commissioner Chen. Likewise, yeah. All right, and Commissioner Holford Smith. I agree, it's appropriate. Okay, great. So I think we all agree on this one. So Commissioner Chapin, would you read the motion? Okay, thank you, uh, Sarah. <clears throat> In the matter of a certificate of appropriateness, Borough of Queens, uh, LPC 2301614, 37 51, and 37 55, 79th Street, Jackson Heights Historic District. A Neo Tudor style garden apartment building designed by H. Hamilton and built in 1925 to 1926. Application is to reconstruct and modify a courtyard wall. I know that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Jackson Heights Historic District. I recommend approval, finding that the proposed widening of the entrance portal will enable vehicular access to meet current clearance requirements, which have expanded over time, that the work will eliminate the presence of unsympathetic alterations, including parging and misplaced, mismatched brick, thus returning these elements to a condition more in keeping with their original appearance, that the proposed entrance portal reconstruction will feature full white brick and stone walls that match the historic construction details, utilizing salvaged marble and new marble units to match and new brick to match the historic brick in terms of placement, size, color, texture, and bond pattern. That the proposed iron work will be simply designed and compatible with the agent style of the building and will match the existing ironwork in terms of details and finish, and that the work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building or historic district. <clears throat> Thank you. And Commissioner Holford Smith, would you second that motion? I second it. Thank you. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Master? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. With 10 in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. All right, that's approved. Thank you. And uh, that concludes our morning session. We're going to break now for lunch and we'll come back at 12.50 and... Sorry. Sarah, we need to do the second motion. Oh, we for need the to other. do the second motion. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, all right. Uh, Commissioner Holford Smith, would you do the second motion? We'll give Diana a break. Sure. <laughs> Thanks. That's fine. So Thank I'm, you. I'm... Do you have it? If you... Yes, okay. I do. Okay. Yep. <laughs> In the matter of LPC 2307 37-52 and 37-5680th 50th Street in the Jackson, Height, Jackson Heights Historic District. Neo Tudor style garden apartment buildings designed by H. Hamilton and built in 1925-1926. Application is to reconstruct and modify a courtyard wall. I note that the building's style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Jackson Heights Historic District. I recommend approval finding that the proposed widening of the entrance portal will enable vehicular access to meet current clearance requirements, which have expanded over time, that the work will eliminate the presence of unsympathetic alterations, including parging and mismatched brick, thus returning these elements to a condition more in keeping with their original appearance, 
that the proposed entrance portal reconstruction will feature full white brick and stone walls that match the historic construction details, utilizing solid <coughs> marble and new marble units to match, and new brick to match the historic brick in terms of placement, size, color, texture, and bond pattern. That the proposed ironwork will be simply designed and compatible with the age and style of the building and will match the existing ironwork in terms of details and finish. And that the work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building or historic district. Thank you. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Okay, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Master? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. With 10 in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. Thank you very much. All right, so that now concludes our uh, morning session. We're gonna take a break for lunch. We'll return at 12.50. We'll ask all members of the public to voluntarily exit the meeting at this time so that you don't have difficulties, technical difficulties, should you wish to return for the afternoon session. And um, we'll see everybody at 12.50. Thank you.